It's not the way it used to be. Amen. Thank you so much, Lisa and Carol. Now, guys, if you would, it's been a long time since I've been able to ask any of you guys to do this. Open up to James chapter 3. And once you are open up there, go ahead and stand on up to your feet. And then I will lead you in the reading of God's word. And then after I read God's word, I would ask all of you to sit, except for the mothers. I would encourage you to remain standing because I want to spend a, a special moment of prayer for you all. So open up to James chapter 3, and we are going to be reading uh, verses 13 through 18 today. So James... Chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, this is what we read. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You may be seated. Except you must. You may not be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these women who are gathered here today, Lord. Father, whom you have blessed to be mothers and to be grandmothers, Lord. God, I thank you for each and every single one of them. And Lord, it is my prayer this morning that that wisdom that is from above would be poured out upon them in abundant measure, God. Lord, we know that there is so much pressure on mothers, Lord, coming from the world, coming from our old natural fallen natures, and even coming from the enemy, Father, to exercise a wisdom that is not from you. But Lord, we thank you that because of Christ's death, because of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, Lord, we can receive wisdom from you. Lord, and that we can be the people you called us to be. And so I pray for these women, these mothers here, Lord, that they would raise their children with wisdom, those who still have children at home. Father God, I pray for those, Lord, who are grandmothers in here, that they would be able to pour your truth and your love into their grown children and into their grandchildren, Lord, so that they might be a blessing, Father God, to them. And I ask on this day, Lord, that it is intended to honor mothers, Lord, I pray that they would see the honor that is upon them, God, and this wonderful responsibility and gift that is given to them, Lord, as a mother, Jesus. I pray your grace and your hand, Father God, will be upon them, Lord, and that they would see, Lord, just how pleased you are with them and the job that you've called them to do. And Father, I want to pray as well for those who do not have mothers, Lord, whose mothers have passed or maybe their relationships with their mothers are strained. Lord, help them to remember, Father, that they do have you in heaven who are greater than any mother and any father and you love them, Lord, to the greatest degree. Jesus, I pray comfort those who mourn loss. Lord, comfort those who mourn loss of relationship, Jesus. And be with them during this time as I know Mother's Day can be a difficult time for some people. But Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come into this time and to use it to bring forth good and your glory. Mothers, you may be seated. And Jesus, I pray over the preaching of your word that your truth would be spoken forth in power today. I pray that we would have humble hearts. I pray that we would be willing to receive from you everything, God, that you have to give us this morning, Lord, everything that is good and pleasing, Lord, to you. I pray that you would instruct us in, Father, so that we might walk in the manner that you've called us to walk, Lord, and that we might exercise the wisdom, Father, that comes down as a gift from you, Father. 
so that we might live those lives of good obedience and gentleness, Lord. So Jesus, we commit ourselves into your hands. We invite your Holy Spirit to come into this place. And we seek, Lord, your will to be accomplished. In Christ's name, amen. All right, guys, let me ask you a question here really quick. When you go up to an apple tree and you pull an apple off of that tree, what kind of apple do you want? Do you want one that the birds have pecked at, that a worm has burrowed a hole through, and the squirrels have devoured half of? Or do you want one that is good and ripe and ready to be eaten? You, yeah, you want that one, right? You want the good one. You don't want the worm-bitten, bird-pecked, squirrel-eaten fruit, do you? You want the good fruit. And the thing is, in our lives as believers, we need to recognize one of the most common metaphors used to describe the Christian is that of a fruit tree. And we are constantly asked, what kind of fruit are we producing, and is it the kind of fruit that God wants to take and enjoy, or is it the kind of fruit that does not please the Lord? And the thing that we find in the scriptures is that we have the choice of what kind of fruit we're going to produce, whether it be good fruit or whether or not it be bad fruit. And James here, in this passage of scripture, in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, challenges us to be the people of good fruit. And one of the things that James emphasizes as being foundational for us to be people who produce good fruit is that we be people who walk in wisdom. That we be people who walk in wisdom. And of course, wisdom is one of the great themes of Scripture. As a matter of fact, the book of Proverbs is a book that is entirely based on the pursuit of wisdom and the need for us as God's people to exercise wisdom in our lives. And James picks up on this theme of wisdom. And of course, what is wisdom? It's closely connected to knowledge, because without knowledge, you can't have wisdom. But the truth is, it's not enough to just have knowledge. Knowledge acquires information. It can learn many things and add to its mind just a wealth of information. But it's not enough to have knowledge. You have to have wisdom, because what does wisdom do? Wisdom knows how to take knowledge and it knows how to put it to good use. That is what separates knowledge from wisdom. Wisdom knows how to take knowledge and use it well. James says in James 3.13, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, in the gentleness of wisdom. One of the great themes in the book of James is that it's not enough to just believe the right things and to know the right things. You have to do the right things. If you are a wise person, it will show itself out, James says, in how you live. Who among you is wise and understanding? Again, what does James say? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But what's surprising, though, is that before James goes into explaining what is the good wisdom that we should walk in, James warns us of a bad wisdom. And if you guys tuned in last week, I talked about this bad wisdom that James, James warned us against. That wisdom that shows itself out in envy and selfish ambition. And its fruits are disorder and every evil thing. And James says this wisdom, as I spoke about last week, that is to be avoided, is a wisdom that doesn't find its source here on, or doesn't find its source from God, but it finds its source here on earth. It's earthly. Meaning, if you want to learn the wisdom of this world, turn on the TV. You'll find it all over the place. And the thing you'll find about the wisdom that is earthly is that it has no problem contradicting itself. It throws out, throws out all sorts of different ideas, ideologies, religions. Brandon, would you turn the sound down this slide bit? It has all of these different countering philosophies and ideas that are constantly warring with one another. And as well, he says that this wisdom that is to be avoided is a wisdom that is natural. What does that mean? It's that wisdom that you were naturally born with, which, sorry to tell you guys, you weren't born angels. 
If you actually pay attention to what the scripture says, the Bible says that each and every single one of us were born as children of the devil, as rebels against God, having a fallen nature and a fallen flesh that doesn't desire to submit to God, but to re rebel against God. That's why one of the most stupid lyrics that you always hear in music every time you turn on the radio is, don't listen to everybody else, follow your heart. And I would say there's probably truth. You shouldn't listen to everybody, but at the same time, you shouldn't listen to your heart because your heart, in the way it is born naturally, is evil, wicked, and corrupt, and it's not going to give you the best advice in the world. Let me ask you, how many of you have lost friends because you followed your heart? They offended you, and so you followed your heart, and you did exactly what you felt like you should do in that moment. And you responded back at them with anger, and you lashed out at them because you followed your heart. How many of you guys have broken hearts from broken relationships and broken pasts because you went running after some guy or some girl because you were following your heart? There's a wisdom that is natural to us guys that is not a safe thing for us to follow. But as well, there's a wisdom that is not from above, but it is spiritual. But it's not the good kind of spiritual. James says, it's demonic. And I'm not making this up. It's right here in the verses. Earthly, natural, demonic. And here's the thing we have to remember. There are two spiritual forces at work in this world. The spirit of God and the spirit of the evil. And these two are at war with one another. And here's the thing about the wisdom that is demonic. Much like earthly wisdom and natural wisdom, it doesn't care what decision you make or what direction you go as long as it's not the one that leads you to Jesus. Do you realize, guys, demons are neither religious nor are they atheists, and they don't care which one you pick as long as you pick the one that doesn't lead you to Jesus? Muslim or, uh, Demons have no problem encouraging people to join Islam, to join Hinduism, to join vague American belief in God, which the majority of people still claim to do, and yet only 50% of people in America choose, uh, claim to actually have a belief in Jesus, yet the majority of people will still claim to believe in God. Demons don't care if you're an atheist. Demons don't care if you believe in God. All they care is that you don't submit to Jesus Christ. They don't care about the rest of it. You know demons don't care if you're liberal or conservative, as long as you're a liberal or a conservative that is away from Jesus. They don't care. And that is why one of the things that you see within the world is so much chaos and disorder because what they want people to do is get in fights, get in wars, and attack one another and get the focus off of Jesus. Because as long as your focus isn't on Jesus, they win. This is why demons don't even actually care if your butt is sitting in a church pew as long as you are tuned out and not submitting your heart to Jesus. You know, some of the darkest times in our world's history was when large populations of the world came to church, and we refer to that time period as the Dark Ages for a reason. Doctrine was a whack, behavior was askew, things were not in a good place. And the demons didn't care. Why? Because people weren't submitting to Jesus. They were submitting to false ideas, false ideologies, false doctrines that were leading them further and further away from Jesus. Don't think our enemy is stupid. He is not stupid. There's a reason why James refers to it as wisdom, but he refers to it as a wisdom that is not from above, a wisdom that is to be avoided. Because what does it create? It creates disorder in every evil thing. Hey guys, how many of you have been on social media this week, this month? since COVID-19 came out. Satan is having a heyday with people. Liberals, conservatives, everybody. Everybody's posting their thoughts, everybody's posting their ideas, everybody's posting every other little video that comes popping up, and everybody's fighting with each other, calling each other ignorant and stupid. Guys, can I tell you right now, Satan doesn't care if you post the thing that's right, if your attitude is full of hatred and anger and frustration towards the people that you posted that post against. He doesn't care as long as it is creating evil and frustration and division and hurt. That's what the enemy wants. Disorder, as James said, and every evil thing. But God has a wisdom that he wants us to have. A wisdom that James says is from above. And what does it mean that that wisdom is from above? It means that it finds its source in God. It means you're not going to find it here 
in the secular world. You're not going to find it in some secret recesses of your heart. And you're certainly not going to find it from demons. You're only going to find it from the Lord. And James, in saying that it is a wisdom that is from above, should remind us of what James had said earlier in chapter 1, that every good gift comes down from above. Guys, do you realize this wisdom that should lead and guide and direct our lives is a gift that God wants to give us? And he wants to give it to us because he recognizes, apart from him, we're not going to find it. Because he's going to recognize, apart from him, it cannot be obtained. It must be something that we receive as a gift and as a present, as something that we ourselves cannot obtain unless the Lord were to hand it down to us from his throne. And he describes, James does, the characteristic of this wisdom. What this wisdom does in showing itself out in God's people. As he said earlier, those of you who are wise and understanding, let him show by his good deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. James now expounds on what that wisdom should look like in our lives. Because as he said before, what is the wisdom from below? How does it show itself out? He said with envy and selfish ambition. Now he says, if you're following the wisdom that is from God, he says first and foremost, it's pure. What does he mean that it's pure? He means that it is morally free of any spiritual defilement. It's good. How many of you guys in a desperation for water have ever looked down at a mud puddle and thought, you know what? If push comes to shove, I might have to swing out of that. I can tell you guys in my life there have been moments. I grew up in the mountains of Montana. Normally we would have nice, clean, flowing streams. And when I was on some stupid 10-mile hike up in the mountains, when I ran out of water because I never packed enough, I could always go there and drink out of it and it was fine. But I can tell you, there were occasions when I was out of water, the streams were dried up, and all I could find was an elk track that had a little bit of water in the bottom. And I can tell you, there are moments when that is appealing. Well, let me ask you, though. Which would you prefer and which is better for you? The muddy water you find in the elk track or the good clean water that you're able to get out of your faucet? Which one do you want? You want the pure water, don't you? And here's the thing. God is never going to leave us with the choice between the muddy and the defiled and the pure. He always gives us the opportunity for that which is pure and good. And he tells us, if you come to me, you will always get the wisdom that is free from sin. You will always get the wisdom, the knowledge, and the direction for your life so that you can make the choice that won't lead you down a dirty path that will defile your soul. The wisdom that comes from God is always pure and it's always good. And why is it? Because it comes down from heaven, and there is nothing evil or wicked with the Lord in heaven. He always gives that which is good, if that is what we choose to take when it is offered to us. As well, what does he say about this wisdom? He, he says that it is peaceable and it is gentle. Jesus, in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 5 and 9, said, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the gentle, and blessed are the peacemakers. What will the gentle receive? He says they'll receive the earth. Who is the gentlest man who ever lived? He was a man by the name of Jesus Christ. Sunday school answer. He was a man by the name of Jesus what did Jesus purchase when he went to the cross? He purchased the world. You guys got to remember, the natural world as it is in rebellion against God belongs to Satan and the devil and the enemy. When Jesus went to the cross, he defeated, he defeated Satan, defeated sin, defeated death, and so the world now belongs to him. And how did he do it? He did it through his gentle submission of willingness to do whatever the Father called him to do. Lay his life down as a sacrifice. Not lash out at those who were against him. Not lash out at his enemies. But lay himself down 
as a gentle lamb for the sins of mankind and the world was given to them. And what is the incredible promise then that is given for us who walk in gentleness? That just as Jesus received the world, now he is willing as a glorious God and Savior to share it with us. This is why one of the greatest blessings that we are looking forward to is that after we die, we will not, as the cartoons so foolishly show, be sitting on clouds naked and playing harps. We're going to be here on the world ruling and reigning with Christ. That is what we are going to be doing. But he says, though, but it's for those who are gentle. As well, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And guys, let's remember something. Do you know who our greatest enemy was before we went to the cross, before Jesus went to the cross and part of Romans 5? And I'm saying Romans 5 because some of you are going to get mad at what I have to say, but I want you to go back to the Bible and look at it. Do you know who our greatest enemy was according to Romans 5 before Jesus went to the cross? It wasn't Satan. It was God. Because we were at enmity with him. We were his enemies. We were in rebellion against him. What did Jesus accomplish according to Romans chapter 5 when he died on the cross? He made peace between us and God. He removed our sins. When we were God's enemies. Now here's the incredible thing about the gospel you've got to understand. God was our greatest enemy at that time, but at the same time he was our greatest hope and savior. When we were enemies of God, when we were rebelling against God, when we were at enmity with him, the Bible says that in that moment God sent his son Jesus Christ out of love to make peace with us so that we could be at peace with God. We were his enemies, but now we are blessed and able to be called his children. And this wisdom that comes down from above, just as it should produce the gentleness that Jesus showed when he laid himself down on the cross for us, so should be the peace that Jesus brought when he laid himself down for his enemies so that we could be reconciled to God. You know, there's something in this world that's unavoidable. As much as you try to avoid it, it's unavoidable. And it's confrontation, isn't it? You can't avoid confrontation. And if you avoid confrontation at all costs, I can tell you right now, you're in sin. We have, at times, to confront people. We have to confront sin sometimes. If you're a parent, you have to confront it in your child, don't you? You have to. If you're a non-confrontational person and you don't confront sin in your children, your children are going to grow up to be little monsters. Some of you guys know those kids who grew up to be little monsters because their parents never confronted them. Confrontation is an extremely important thing. Even within the church, even among friends, even among the people of God, confrontation is going to happen. But guys, can I tell you though, there is a difference between a confrontation that is gentle and peaceable and a confrontation that is out to make war. Jesus confronted our sins, did he not? When he was in this world, he called out sin. Go read the Gospels. He called out sin hard. He didn't let sin pass. But he did it with an attitude of gentleness, and he did it with the desire to make peace, not make war. And that is how it was that we were able to be reconciled to him. And we have the choice in our lives when people are pushing us, when they're shoving us, when they're hurting us, and we have to respond. How are we going to respond? Are we going to respond in the wisdom of the world that would tell us to lash out or to get even or to pay them back? Or are we going to respond with the gentleness and peace of Jesus Christ that is given to us by the wisdom that comes down from above? It's a choice that we have to make, and here's the thing. The fruit that we want to see in our lives is all going to depend on which choice. When you have to confront, if you choose to do it in anger, you're going to reap a harvest of unrighteousness. You will lose friendships. There will be hurt feelings. Things are not going to go well. But when you do it with peace and gentleness, that is when there is the hope for the harvest of righteousness for them and for you. 
I had a real funny example of this happened earlier this week. How many of you children have been absolute perfect angels throughout all of COVID-19? I don't know if it's like you guys. I think my kids have needed to get a little bit of separation from one another, but it hasn't been able to happen. And it was just the other day, uh, things were getting particularly riled up in my home and kids. I'm sorry for using this example. You guys can cover your ears, hide under the pews, do whatever you guys want to do. But they were getting particularly riled up. Three of them were outside, bounced around the trampoline. One of them or two of them were screaming at each other at the top of their lungs. And so in all the mildness and gentleness and peacefulness that I could muster as a father, I poked my head out the door and I said, kids, knock it off! And why did I do that? Because I'm a loving parent. <laughs> right? I, I still love the parents who say, I'm never going to yell at my children. I want to say either one, you're a liar, or two, I will visit them in June. Okay? <laughs> you are going to yell at your children. That's why I'm going to even tell you, sometimes confrontation is going to come across a little strong. But I can tell you right now, there's something that is important. My heart was a heart of peace. I want there to be peace in my home, and I want there to be peace between my kids. And it's gentle, because here, even as I have had to do this morning with one of my kids, when it comes time for discipline, I do not discipline my children in anger. Do not do it. I do not spank them when I'm mad. Do not do it. But I will be firm. I will call it out. And then discipline will happen. But I will always reaffirm to them a hundred more times than I'll ever discipline them how much I love them and how much I want the utmost best for them. Christians, sometimes that's going to have to be your interactions with one another. Sometimes you have to be firm. But if your heart is one of peace, and gentleness, good fruit can come forth from that. As well, he says that the fruit that is from above is also reasonable. What does he mean that it is reasonable? You know, this is an interesting little thing he brings up here. But it's to recognize the fact that we are people who need to be reasonable in our relationships and interactions. Not in demanding our way all the time, but open to hear ideas and thoughts that are different than our own. Alistair Begg, when I was listening to a sermon preached by him uh, earlier this week, he shared a story of how when he was early on in the ministry, this was back in the 1970s, he was picked up by one of his ministerial mentors, and they were on their way to deal with a situation that was uh, uh, per particularly tense in the church. I know this might be shocking to you guys. Uh, sometimes churches have tense situations, and people don't get along, and there's problems. And they were dealing with one of these things in the church. And his mentor looked at young Alistair and said, Alistair, I want you to know something. There is a difference between knowing your mind and having your mind made up. There's a difference between knowing your mind and having your mind made up. Listen, we all should know our opinions and why we believe the things that we believe, why we hold to the things that we hold to, and why we um, are going to back up certain belief systems when certain situations and scenarios appear. But we have to recognize there's a difference though, between knowing and knowing why and having your mind made up. The reasonable person does not enter every situation with his mind already made up. He's willing to hear both sides of the situation. He's willing to hear both sides of an argument. He's willing to hide, hear both sides of whatever is going on, and then they're willing to seek wisdom so that the best decision and the best outcome might be reached. I've heard it said before, and I think in one way it's right. Listen, if you don't think your ideas are the best ideas, there's probably something wrong with you. You need to have confidence and believe your ideas are good ideas, because if not, you're going to walk through life with absolute zero confidence and never get anything done. But wisdom demands a humility that is willing to have your ideas, your thoughts challenged so that you might be persuaded in a different direction, a direction that is better than the idea that you initially had when going into a situation. And what's interesting about this little uh, term there for reasonable is that it really is used scripturally and linguistically within the context of this whole issue of submission, of submission, of laying ourselves down before our authorities and going along with them and what they're asking us to do. Ephesians 5, 6 through 5 talks about this with employees to employers. 
Uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 talks about this with children to parents. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 talks about this with wives to husbands. Ephesians 5, 21 lays it out. This is a Christian, a Christian principle across the board. Christian to Christian, we need to be deferring and submitting to one another. We see it as well when it comes to our state, uh, us, and how we submit to our state government uh, in Romans chapter uh, 13. We see it also in how congregants, church members, are supposed to submit to their leadership and how men generally are supposed to submit to God. You know, I don't know how many of you guys have found this, but when you are willing to be reasoned with, especially your employers, your leaders, when you're willing to listen to them and to put aside your own ideas, and go along with what they're telling you to do. Generally speaking, life is so much better. I mean, how many of you guys have unfortunately lost your job because you couldn't hold your tongue? I don't want to show up with hands here. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the honesty. It happens sometimes. And what James would say is be reasonable. If they're asking you to do something, even if it kind of grates on you, they're your authority. Go along with them in doing what they asked you to do. Don't fight. Don't argue. Don't push back. I still remember when I was working up in Seattle, my boss told me, all right, Jack, I need you to take all of the supplies. And I was working in a six-story building in downtown Seattle. He said, I want you to take all of the uh, lab supplies from this room. I want you to tear it all down. I want you to go put it over in that room and store it all in there. All right, fine. So I did all of that. One week later, I was told, sorry, Jack, you got to undo it all. Take all that stuff out of that room and go move it over there. So it took me hours. It undid everything I did. And then he said, all right, Jack, now I want you to completely get this lab back up and running. So I had to redo the plumbing, redo the wiring, get everything back up and going, get the lab completely functioning. And then it was within just a few weeks, the company came in to take over that lab, and they decided, you know what, we don't want any of this stuff. So it all got stripped out, and all of my work that I just did got completely removed. Guys, I can't tell you how many people I know have lost jobs in that situation because they decided to go tell their boss off because of how stupid they thought it was that things were being handled in this way. Guys, you want to know how I kept my head about me? It was like this. Every hour that passed was $20 more in my bank account. Okay. It didn't matter if the job was stupid as long as I was getting paid. It's a job. Humble yourself before you find yourself out of a job. Amen. This is just basic wisdom, but how many stupid people are losing their jobs because I think this is stupid and I'm going to tell my boss. And before you know it, there they are out of another job and their family's in need of food. Be reasonable. Be reasonable. Guys, I can be honest, I've never been fired from a job, actually, and except for when they were like, you know, corporate layoffs and all that kind of stuff. And I've always, you know, been given raises and things, and the most of the jobs I had, because one of the things that absolutely stuck out to me is, you know what, if I just am reasonable and do what my boss likes, everybody likes you. And you get your work done. And you're not a problem. Guys, that's something from God. I want to be frank, a lot of people in our world are missing out on. The next thing... The mercy that is from above shows, or this wisdom from above shows, is it shows itself out in mercy. It's full of mercy. It restrains judgment. As God is merciful to us, his enemies, children of the devil, children of wrath, those who are deserving hell according to scripture, if he's merciful to us in not giving us what we deserve, mercy then from us should be willing to help and to assist others who don't deserve help. But you're merciful to them. Because Christ was merciful to you. Remember what James said in James 2.13? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me ask you, what would it be like if one day when you messed up and you were bringing your sin to God, when God finally said, eh, I'm done. I'm done. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. What hope would there be for any of us? None of us have hope. None of us would have hope. But in our interactions with one another, we need to recognize something very important. As Jesus is merciful to us, so we need to be merciful to one another. You know, guys, if you ever want to be a disciple maker, as the Bible commands you to be disciple makers, if our church 
wants to grow in being more of a disciple-making church, we have to make sure we are people who are merciful to each other. And I can tell you right now, if we get a person who's been walking with Jesus for a year and we get another person who's only been walking with Jesus for a year, those two are bringing in a lot of wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic with them. It's the way it's going to be because they have learned to discern the difference and how to seek out that which is good and reject that which is evil. And you know what's going to happen when those two get together? There's going to be a fight. It's an inevitable thing. It always happens. It's just how it is. But this is where we have to make sure that we're being merciful to them. That we're being kind and patient. We're not picking sides. We're not going one against the other. But we're making sure that we are showing the same mercy that God continually every day shows us. As he conforms us more and more to the image of Christ. It takes mercy to do discipleship. The next thing James says, and I'm just going to skip over this one, is good fruits. Because we're going to look at that in uh, the wrap up. But then he says as well that it's unwavering and it's without hypocrisy. This wisdom from above is unwavering and without hypocrisy. What does it mean that it's unwavering? It means it's stable. It stands firm. It stands firm. You know, I recently saw a uh, tweet from a, uh, shared by one of my pastor friends, and he said something that I thought was extremely profound and it, um, has really got me thinking. And it's this. I have quit trying to be liked, and I've now started to demand respect. Because here's the thing, if you try to get everybody to like you, you're going to get a lot of people who dislike you. Because in order to get everybody to like you, that means there's going to be people who like you, and there's going to be people who don't like the people who do like you because they don't like the people who do like you. They are not going to like you even though you didn't do anything to make them not like you. They're just not going to like you because of the very nature of your being of trying to get people to like you. It is a vicious circle. And guys, I can tell you right now, it hurts, and I've been there. But you want to know how you gain respect? It's by being unwavering. It's by standing firm. It's standing firm in the truth with whoever it is, wherever it is, however, whatever, in whatever situation arises. Now, of course, it shows itself out in peace and gentle because you can be an unwavering jerk and we don't want to be that guy. But you need to be an unwavering, spirit-filled man or woman of God that will bear good fruits out in relationships that is unhypocritical. Meaning this, you don't come to church on Sunday, take communion that morning, and then go home that night and just get yourself completely sloshed out with a few beers in your system. There's no being the Sunday morning Christian and the Friday night partier. That doesn't work. That's complete hypocrisy. And guys, I'm going to be frank. You know, I see it in our world down here all the time. You know, so many people claim they go to church, so many people claim they're Christians, and yet so many people are shooting themselves up with drugs and alcohol and doing all these kinds of things, being absolute hypocrites. We can't do that as believers. As well as, guys, we can't be holding secret sins in our life. We can't be preaching purity to our children and telling kids you need to save sex for marriage, where at the same time when our wives and kids are gone, we pull out our phones and indulge in a little bit of pornography. There's no place for that. That is hypocritical. That is not the wisdom that comes down from above. We can't do it. And I know it's a struggle for people, but the wisdom that is from above allows us to live without hypocrisy if we submit to that wisdom when it comes. And then James, after listing out all of these characteristics here, he touches on what are the results then? When the wisdom from above is allowed to go into full effect, what are the results? And James says, this is it. The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, here's the incredible thing about fruit. Fruit doesn't dictate what a plant is. It simply reveals what a plant is. Right? Right? When you plant apple seeds and apples are produced, what does it show? That's an apple tree that came from an apple seed. When we as Christians are sowing good seeds, when we're sowing peace, mercy, gentleness, reasonableness, an unwavering spirit, free of hypocrisy, what is going to come forth? 
a harvest of righteousness, because those are things of righteousness. But Paul warns that just as there are seeds of righteousness, there are also seeds of evil. And so we need to recognize the kind of fruits we have in our lives are all dependent on the kinds of seeds that we are sowing. Is it the seeds that come down from the wisdom that is from above that shows itself out in peace? Or is it the seeds that are sown from the wisdom that is from below that shows itself out in disorder and every evil thing? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In conclusion, let me share with you guys a quick story. And this is really recent, actually. This is from just last night. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys uh, saw my Facebook page here in the last couple days, but there was a pastor here recently who, at the age of 49, just lost his life. The man's name was Darren Patrick. He was actually a pastor up in uh, St. Louis for a number of years, and now he's over in South Carolina. And I, I don't want to go into his full story and everything here, um, I mean, a real great story of rise, fall, redemption. I mean, just good, good God. You know, just what the Lord done through him has been so great and excellent. He's impacted my life from afar. I met this man once at a conference when he was giving a, a lesson and a lecture on dealing with ministry stress and burnout. Because I don't know if you guys know this, ministers have a tendency to get stressed and burned out. And I was at this conference and I had an opportunity to talk with him and he shared some advice with me and... Just a couple days ago, it was reported that he had died. And the sad thing is, the report is that he died of a self-inflicted gunshot. And from the things that are kind of being said by his friends and those who are close to him, it's not sounding like it was an accident. Now, I hope to find out it was, but it's not sounding like it was. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, that has put me into just a complete leap despair for a couple of days. I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know I struggle with depression and, you know, just kind of being a down person. You know, if you were to put me on the cast of Winnie the Pooh, I'd be Eeyore. You know, that's me. And when I first found out about it, I was talking to my wife about it, and I was doing dishes, and I had my back turned to her because I literally just started crying. I was thinking about that. Because here, I mean, if it is true that he did commit suicide, I mean, this is the third, you know, um, large profile Christian leader who's committed suicide in the last three years. I mean, it feels like every year there's a new one. Bam, bam, bam. I actually saw a statistic. I don't know how you guys know this. Uh, <laughs> ministry is actually in the top five career paths for suicide. There's something you guys don't hear about a lot, but it is actually true, I think, <laughs> from what I've read and what's been said. I haven't went out and counted everyone, but and I was, in, and man, it just depressed me so much and broke my heart so much. You know, to see another man that I respected so much come to that place of despair. And my mind just got filled with so many thoughts of, oh, man, what's going to put the end going to be for me? Is there any hope for us pastors and ministers who struggle? I mean, oh, come on. But there was this moment yesterday. We were out at Dave McCinney's house. We are having a barbecue. Man, this has just been weighing on me, weighing on me, weighing on me. And I even asked David if he knew about the situation, what had happened, and he hadn't heard about it. My son Landon came walking up to me, and he asked, Hey, Dad, you want to play some football? You want to play some two-hand touch football? And deep down inside my soul, I'm in this place. When you're depressed, you don't want to do anything. And I just told Landon, No, buddy, I don't want to. I'm sorry. David's sitting right next to me. Hey, Grandpa, you want to play football? David's like, yeah, sure, I'll play football. So David gets up in his overalls and his work boots, and he goes out in the field with him. And so I sat there for a minute, and I was just like, I got a choice. I got a choice. I can wallow in this, and I can think about it and mull it over for the hundredth time. And I can listen to the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of my flesh, and of demons, that wants me to stay in that place and keep thinking about it, that will produce fruits of unrighteousness, or I can choose right now to follow the wisdom that is from above, which in that moment was as simple as saying, you know what, I'm going to go play football with my kids. And I got up, went out to the field, 
Me, Olin, and my brother-in-law Joey and David were huffing and puffing and falling all over the ground, recognizing how evil this natural world has been to our natural bodies here in recent years. But you know what happened? I was able to feel the depression and the darkness lift. And the real sweetness of it wasn't even necessarily within the game itself. It was within the conversation time that I was able to have with my children last night when it was just me and them sitting on the couch. And we were just talking and joking because they were excited. They were jacked up because of the fun we just had. So they still had the little kid adrenaline all going crazy. And it inspired life back in. Small. It might seem like a small, inconsequential thing at times. Just choosing. Joy over gloom. But guys, it can make all the difference in the world in your life. It can make all the difference in the world. When you are faced with those situations that are bringing you down, are you going to pick the wisdom that is from above that is peaceful, gentle, reasonable? Or are you going to go with your natural feelings, ideas of the world, and the influences of the enemy? and produce a harvest of sin, anger, bitterness, resentment, and brokenness. Guys, here's my closing exhortation to you. If you have the choice between life and death, always pick life. Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness that was shown out to us on the cross so many years ago. And Lord, we thank you that you are continually, daily, pouring out your Holy Spirit upon us and giving us the wisdom that is from above. And it is my prayer for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that they would choose that wisdom for themselves, God. That wisdom that is from above. That they would reject the wisdom and the influences of this world that want to produce despair and hurt. And Lord, that they would pick the wisdom that will bring life and fruits of righteousness, Lord. Fruits that are pleasing and honoring God to you. And I pray this in Christ's holy name.